Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Tony Rahm. I'm the technology policy reporter for The Washington Post. We're here today to talk about probably the biggest issue in tech in 2018. I'm sure some people would fight me on that one, but uh, it's online privacy, what consumers think about what's happening with their data, and the prognosis for online privacy regulation this year, next year, and beyond. Um, I've got a fabulous panel of folks sitting next to me. Randall Stevenson, CEO of AT&T, Julie Sweet, the CEO of Accenture in North America, and uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. We have about a half hour. Uh, I'm the thing standing between you and drink, so hopefully I will be interesting. Uh, so thanks so much for being here, guys. Um, I want to start off by reading a couple of data points. Um, and this is from some data that the Commerce Department put together and released uh, just earlier this year based off of surveying consumers in 2017. And they found that three quarters of Americans they had surveyed had significant concerns about online privacy and security risks. A third said it made them hold back on their online activities. And 20% said that they had experienced some form of breach or identity theft or any sort of digital crime. And this was before all of this stuff that we saw happened and revealed this year. So I'd love to hear from all of you. And Randall, we can start with you. You know, we know that people are concerned, but based on your perspective, are people changing the way that they use the internet or changing the way that they use their devices because of these concerns? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> We've always believed that if you don't get the privacy policies right and the laws around privacy right, people are going to be reluctant to use the device. They're going to be reluctant to engage in online commerce. And these are things that I think all of us up here say from a business standpoint is a bad answer. And we also just think from a customer experience it's a bad answer. So I, I think getting privacy legislation done addresses a lot of these because until we get it right, it's going to be an inhibiting factor for just user engagement. But, but, but are we at the point where users are willing to say no to a, a smartphone or no to a social networking site that may or may not be called Facebook because of what's happening with those sites and the ways that they're using data? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, what's one of the fastest growing websites around, DuckDuckGo, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a search engine. Julie, that what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you've really talked about is trust, right? And there is a real crisis around trust at a time when you think about the opportunity for the U.S. and the globe around the digital economy. And that's why um, we are actually at the Business Roundtable. You have 200 CEOs who've come together and said, we need a call for action. We propose a national a law on privacy that provides core consumer privacy rights that will, it, you know, is designed to reestablish trust. And those are the basic rights around uh, transparency, control of your data, uh, the right to access it, correct it, and delete it. And we think it's important that uh, the Congress act as a private sector. We want to lead and work with, uh, with Congress to do that and to provide it consistently, regardless if you live in California or Washington or Oregon, we need one single consistent standard. Sure, we're going to get into that proposal in a second, but Jamie, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, you all, everyone in this room is guilty of pushing a button that says, I agree. And you didn't read what you agreed to, every single one of you. And you gave your bank pass codes away. So we studied 40 or 50 apps, and that we know what you agreed to. And you agreed to stuff that would surprise you. So I don't really think the question is a survey and whether people are there. They don't know. And, and they don't know the extent of it. And they have the, and I think there's just basic right and wrong. That, that people should be treated a certain way, and they should know what's going on, and it should be made simpler. And so that's it, critical. We don't see people, like certain institutions, we don't see people using banks less because they're pretty much guaranteed from problems if, if it happens at a bank. But that's not true at other companies. And so you've seen the amount of fraud going up, the amount of, and, I, and we know some apps, we've had a dramatic drop in usage because people are afraid of it. So, uh, but the real question is, how should you treat a person? You know, one-to-one, -one. how should I treat you and vice versa? And, we, we better get that in place. Sure. But you actually said something similar at an Axios event in March. You said the consumers have, quote, no idea what you agreed to. Yeah. So who's, who, who, who's to blame for that? I hate to use that word. Is it consumers for not doing enough due diligence, or is it companies, frankly, for not doing enough to tell them what they're actually doing with data? Well, you know, it's, I, it's easy to go back and try to point fingers. I, 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 would just want to, I think we should fix the problem going forward. Yeah. And you could, you could be guilty. Anyone could be guilty. I, I, I did it. I mean, you know, just, I'm not saying, but now we know that that data, there are people who buy it, they sell it, they market it, that people say we may, we may use it, they use your health data, they use your location data, they use, and just the question is, okay, now that we've, this thing's become hugely successful, 
right? The internet's unbelievable, mobile phones unbelievable, the smartphones unbelievable, we can do something unbelievable. But now we know it's got this other problem, we should go about fixing it. Sure, one of the reasons you were asked that question in March was because we had just learned that Facebook found itself entangled with Cambridge Analytica, a political consultancy that misused about 87 million uh, people's personal information. Here we are talking now, we had a series of emails released uh, showing the way that Facebook thought about data. To the extent that you had a chance to take a look at some of that reporting, what did you think? Uh, did, is Facebook in a leadership crisis right now when it comes to privacy? I'm not, again, I'm not going to point fingers at the company. They've, they've learned a few lessons. They're trying to, it looks to me, they're trying to react aggressively to those lessons. But they're, you know, they're in the third inning of what I consider a nine inning game. I, I think it's going to be a much longer road than people think. I think the American public will be more upset. I'm not speaking about Facebook, I'm speaking about in general. And you know, there are these issues about, and if you go around the world, by the way, I mean, how governments use this stuff, you know, and Americans aren't going to particularly like that. And so I, I just think we just we should roll up our sleeves and do what Americans do, figure out what's better and fairer going forward. Sure, Randall, what do you think? I mean, Facebook's an app on an iPhone that's available uh, on an AT&T service. So what do you think about Facebook and the way that it's handled? I'm kind of like Jamie. I'm not going to start pointing fingers at other companies, but I, I do think you wanted to make news. I was trying. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I but I, I think I think it's interesting. It's, it's reflective of something you see happening as industries grow, and that is, you have privacy policies, the I agree stuff that Jamie is talking about here, that are written by lawyers to protect the company. And lo and behold, what happens? The customers don't understand what they're doing. And while the company may be legally protected, the reputation is damaged because they were doing things the, comp the customers didn't understand they were doing, right? So I don't think they were doing a lot that was not within their terms and conditions. I just don't think their customers understood it. Sure. Julie, I was reading a, a, a document that Accenture had put out about 2016, I want to say, sort of gauging how businesses were using data and maximizing data value, but doing it in a way that didn't totally freak out consumers. I'm just curious, what, what have you seen from your perspective on what businesses are willing to do with data and the relationships they're willing to have with other businesses when it comes to using that data? Well, I think, look, I mean, data has become a, a real currency, right? Because it allows us to do everything from, I mean, what some of the studies are, consumers say they want to give data because they want better service, right? So there's, you know, I think what consumers are looking for is they want to be able to trust because they actually want to access the services. And from a business perspective with things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, data is the fuel for that. And we see lots of, you know, advantages, everything from, you know, we're going to be able to feed more people and, you know, solve, uh, you know, access. Uh, you know, better medical care to we're going to create new growth, you know, new models for businesses to providing much better customer experience. And so I think the, it's clear that data is the foundation for better, you know, for better societies, for customers, and for businesses if used appropriately. And, to, you know, to Jamie's point and Randall's, like, that's why we've got to get it right going forward. Mm -hmm. So this morning, the Business Roundtable released uh, its vision for what privacy regulation should look like. We wrote about it in the Post, which is definitely not a plug to go read our Tech 202 newsletter. Uh, but can you sketch us through, like, briefly what you guys are proposing the government should do here? Sure. Well, it starts with their core rights for consumers. The right to transparency, to know how, uh, how businesses are using data, the right to control that data, including whether or not it can be sold, the right to access that data and correct um, inaccuracies, and the right to delete that data. So that's the core of the legislation that we're proposing. And then around that, what we've said is it's important that those rights be consistent and so that we have a federal law that preempts state and local laws. What we have today is very inconsistent. It's quite fragmented. Consumers don't know what what to expect, and businesses have a hard time complying. And then finally, uh, a clear enforcement mechanism and a compliance uh, and compliance that's based on risk uh, and you know appropriately balanced. And really, what this is going to do is allow us to protect consumers, but also continue to promote innovation and the use of data in all the ways that we think are appropriate. I think if you talk to a lot of privacy groups, one of the things that they take most issue with is that consumers don't have the ability to opt into every use of their data or every instance in which that data is collected. Should there be an opt-in standard for everybody? Julie, you want to take that one? Well, I mean, our legislation um, does, does, does 
uh, consider that you're going to have that kind of transparency, right? And so I think the, the details of whether it's opt-in or opt-out or still have to be worked out in terms of what makes sense for the consumer. But the key is transparency. And today you have some companies like the ones here who are, who are you know, being transparent about it, but that is highly inconsistent across industries. And I think what's important is that the legislation that we're, we're proposing really is cross-industry. So the data, the, you know, the data ones that you are citing are saying here and there, but what we're saying is we should have one consistent standard. And it's really unprecedented to see the cross-industry um, agreement that this is the direction we need to go. Sir so Randall, what do you think? Oh, federal, go ahead. As opposed to state by state. Federal. Sure. Right. federal. That, that would be a disaster Sorry. that every state has a different rule and requirement, just executing it. Both for, the, both for the consumer and the company. Yeah. This is the path we're headed down absent some kind of federal legislation, yeah. which I don't know how the consumer navigates that, and I don't know how companies navigate that. Sure, although let's, let's, let's actually talk about the states, because what's driving all this is California, right? California passed its very robust online privacy law. I think a lot of you guys probably would agree at the Business Roundtable that it is not the best law, in your opinion. Uh, but why is it not the best law for consumers? It does give them more ability to say yes and no to things, the ability to go after companies if they do something wrong. Why isn't that. Explain to consumers why that isn't the best approach. I think people, yourself included, make unjustified leaps. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't look at the California law and say it's a disaster. That's not the problem. It's a California law. And then somebody else is going to pass a New Jersey law and a New York law. That's the disaster. And that's where you can't even operate and execute a business. It, and as a consumer... You search Google from New Jersey. Is the law definitely search from California? Right, right. I mean, database. I mean, that, that's the complexity of state law. And if I'm doing yeah, online right. banking with Jamie, I'm in right. Texas, but his, you know, who, right. whose laws apply, you know, to that and so forth. So that's where this just doesn't work. And you've got to get a standardized approach to this across the country. Is that, in your mind, the biggest political obstacle here? There are a lot of folks on the other side of this who think the state should have the rights to do that, particularly because the federal government has done so little on this issue for, what, the past few decades now? The states should prod the federal government to do something, but a state-by-state -state thing would be disaster for the American public. So the principles, I think we all agree to. You know, th there is execution on it, which is very complex, but, but we, it could be done, but you, you really need a federal law. There are a lot of industries you have federal law. You know, if, if states start to act like countries and they have their own laws everywhere, that, that means we'll all be hiring a lot more lawyers, we'll have to put data centers in different places, costs will go up, customers will be hurt. So it's very mm -hmm. easy to say it's good for the customer. We agree with the concept. Transparency, ability to know what you're giving, to opt in, to have control one way or the other of what you give people, to make that simple and clear. Mm -hmm. See, to, right. to what Julie has led here in the, the framework she has put in place, what I love about it, is it's not coming from the perspective of companies. This is coming from the perspective of if you're a customer, and you want to do banking versus you want to access an ISP versus you want to do a search versus you want to watch a video. <clears throat> Absent federal legislation that's broad and general, those are going to be different privacy aspects, different rules surrounding each of those. That's just a disaster from a customer standpoint. It shouldn't matter where I'm going, what kind of activity I'm wanting to do on the internet. Whatever I do on the internet ought to be governed by a single privacy policy. Plus, Tony, as you look at it, I mean, the core rights are not different. Right? And so there's going to be some execution challenges and what kind of compliance, but what it, you know, there's really no disagreement around the core privacy rights. Uh, and so I think that goes back to the leaps that are being made. It's about let's not have the disaster of every state um, and let's focus on what those core rights are. One of the things I was struck by at the end of the document was that it very clearly said that there should be no private right of action here. Why shouldn't consumers have the right to come see you guys if you, you know, very, very seriously misuse their data or violate their expectations? That's for any of you who wants to take that one. Well, let's start with just the cost of a private right of action and the amount, the amount of like litigation and stuff. And as you think about where, where do you want uh, companies spending their money, right? They want you want companies spending their money on things like cybersecurity, providing you know better data protection, putting in the right um, IT systems, right? And uh, and in addition to that, we do provide that states um, can uh, take state AGs on, on behalf of consumers can bring those uh, rights of action. So we think what we're balancing is a strong, you know, strong rights for the consumer, a, a clear enforcement mechanism, but we also want to make sure that we're spending money and keeping the U.S. competitive. With clear, with clear penalties. With very yeah. clear and penalties. Fair. Mm -hmm. You guys would really like to see the U.S. government, the Federal Trade Commission, spend more money, have more money, go after companies that violate the rules? Yes, yeah, it'll have to be resourced better. Absolutely. Yeah.
Sure. Um, Brendel, I want to ask you a specific question which has to do with the federal government because a few years ago the Federal Communications Commission did have online privacy rules. You know, the, I think for a lot of people the big part there was there was the prohibition on selling web browsing history without getting customers permission and stuff. I think some folks, some privacy groups looked to AT&T and they were like, hey, this was there. Folks in the telecom industry lobbied against it. Why wasn't that good enough? The, the problem is what's happened in the industry. ISPs, internet service providers, wireless companies, are over here governed and ruled by one set of rules and a regulator, FCC. Then you have companies, Google, Facebook, virtually everybody else over here under a different set of rules governed by a different regulator, the FTC. That never made sense to us. Here you go again, you're the customer. And if I go to my ISP, I have rights and so forth that are one way at the ISP, but they're very different if I go to Google or very different if I go to Facebook. And my enforcement mechanism are two different regulators. This, this is exactly the kind of confusion that we're talking about. So we always advocated one riot, one ranger. You know, who, who has oversight and responsibility? The privacy requirements on an AT&T or a Comcast or a Verizon should look no different than those on a Google or a Facebook. So, but I think a lot of people then point to the fact that for a long time, telecom companies have sought to exclude themselves from the regulation of the FTC. There's that long-standing prohibition that those companies can't go after common carriers. Is, that, is it safe to say then that AT&T would essentially stand down in that space and say, you know what, we're going to concede that the FTC does have a role here to play? We put out, in fact, I signed it. <laughs> and it was a full-page ad on yep. every major periodical, a consumer bill of rights, where I advocated that we be regulated under the FTC under the same rules as everybody else in this area. So yes, not only would we, we have advocated it. Uh, in, in Europe, obviously, we have GDPR, right? There are very, very tough rules in place there. And in a lot of instances, companies have adapted their practices around the world, right? No, you don't take I, I, it to the G, G, It just started. Yeah. It's com hugely complex in compliance, execution, capability. It's just started. There's a, there's a window of time before all these rules are I think totally effective. It, it's it's going to be a execution disaster. Yeah, that was. I'm, but I'm in favor of the principles behind it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's like saying we want safe driving, but but what they said is the people drive wherever they want, they drive whatever speed they want. It's going to be really complex to execute. You, you just have to separate the two in this case. The principles are much easier than the execution. Yeah, ours are much easier. But also, if you think if you think about why do you not want to have different states is that you know data does not know national boundaries and either do the customers right who are going to go to Europe and that and today to actually be able to connect the laws so that you've got global companies who can have you know what follow one set you have consumers who are do you know who are themselves traveling you need a national law to even begin to be able to harmonize between Europe and the US and that is an, a really important thing that I think um, people miss when they start talking about what the states rights is that we are living in a global world and in the digital economy that's particularly important. Sure. I have to take a pause in the conversation about regulation to ask you guys about two things that's in the news or that has been in the news. Uh, Jamie and... Oh, things. go ahead, please. So there are, also, there's this thing about, like, there's so many anonymous stuff taking place. Mm -hmm. You know, is that, is that legitimate? Should people know who these people... You know, may not who they are, but they're actual real people and not robots being controlled by foreign entities. So you mean bots online on social bots media? Bots online. But also right now you can all have, you know, God, God many how many accounts of these places and say whatever you want anonymous. I'm not against anonymous speech. I don't maybe think it's wrong that, that the provider doesn't know who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, so like we do, banks do anonymous stuff. We move money for people and you don't necessarily know who it is, but we know who you are. You know, you're not an agent of Russia. Yeah. And so I just think there are other important things that have to be picked up to get this right for the country. And also these echo chambers where, you know, when you look at something online and then someone gives you more and more of that, and they're feeding your own echo chamber. Is that, is that was, what it was intended to do? Yeah. And shouldn't that be stopped? Yeah, so, so without violating consumer rights. You know? So regulating social media is something, the speech it, side it, of social it, media. It, it has to be. happen somehow. Randall, what Just do you like think? newspapers were regulated, and yeah. TVs were regulated, and advertisers were regulated. There'll be some form of regulation around it. Sure. Randall, what do you think? There, he's, uh, I don't know to what extent, I don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I, I've not really given it a lot of detailed thought. But I agree with Jamie, there's going to have to be some rules around what are we going to allow and permit in our society in this area. Sure. I, I'm, I'm sort of taken these days when I read a lot of these founders of these companies who walk away and they say, you know, we, we weren't sure what we built. Uh, we're not sure if it has contributed good to the society. Is that the feeling that you guys have too sometimes? You look at social media, you look at some of these tech companies and think, did we cause more harm than good? 
No, I think these tech companies are amazing. The innovation that is in them is amazing. And we as a country deliberately and thoughtfully, I think, went uh, very much hands off. Let these flowers blossom and let these things grow. And so we took a very, very light touch oversight and regulatory approach to them and <laughs> served its purpose. But we may have gone too far before we said, whoa, what are the rules surrounding the use of these things? Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn to those two things in the news. First, uh, Jamie, there was a report in the Wall Street Journal from August 2018 in which Facebook had started talking to big banks about ways to exchange data, whether it was to help consumers uh, check their balances or uh, to help consumers get in touch with the bank when they needed something. So let's just address this on its face now. What's your conversations with Facebook like? Is that something that would ever be on the table given everything that we've seen from I, Facebook? Our, our view, so I'm not going to talk about any one company because we talk to all these companies and stuff like that. Our view is we want you to decide what you do with our, the data that you have for our account. So some people have said, no, if you, we'll put your, the Chase payment systems in our, in our app, but if you do that and you use your debit card or credit card, they want all the data from your credit card and debit card, where you eat, where you lunch, where you stay, the hotels you're at. And of course, I don't think that's fair. So the answer to that would be absolutely not. Now, if you, the customer, knew that was taking place, I can give you an opt-in and an opt-out, like on the screen. Do you want to let them know what hotels you stay at? Click yes or no, and then you can go change it for later. Yeah, I think that'd be perfectly fair. Let the customer kind of give them the control at one point to decide those things. And so, uh, and you see a lot of that. You know, a lot of these people who get bank passcodes, they, they, get, they got a bank passcode for a reason, but you don't know that they can come into the bank systems and get data every five minutes. You know, and which creates huge risk for you, for them, and then they take that data and they sold it. So that, that, that isn't what was intended to do. We've, we do have fights with those people and close them down mm -hmm. and negotiate something that's reasonable and try to set a much higher standard than but that. But are you more or less reluctant to work with Facebook now? Because of everything? I'm not reluctant to work with anyone. I mean, you, mm -hmm. You're making everything binary here. Sure. We will have any conversation with anyone and then we put on the, the lens of what's good for the customer, what would you want, what would make sense? Can we, can we do it in a way that is fair and reasonable and disclosed? Sure. Randall, the right. question I have for you, obviously, is that AT&T has advertising aspirations, right? There's AppNexus. You guys have a very large content powerhouse. Uh, so what exactly does AT&T aspire to do with a lot of this data that it's collecting from its various properties? So we aspire to identify audiences, not people, but audiences. Audiences that are targeted for, is this person a and a tender to buy an automobile. There's an audience that is intending to buy an auto, auto, automobile. If so, what are the characteristics of that audience? They tend to watch certain shows. They tend to go to certain areas. And so based on that, we can go to advertisers and say, here is an audience, not a person. And, and we will never sell that information on a person to anybody. But use the intelligence, use the viewing data, using the, the data off the mobile phone to build audiences only and never identifying an individual. Do you think customers are comfortable with that? Do they understand what they're getting? Or do you think that in some ways they're kind of freaked out? Even though you're keeping all the data within AT&T, you're not selling it, as you said, do they fully understand what you guys are doing? We'll know soon enough because we're going to do it on an opt-in basis. Mm -hmm. If the customer's not comfortable, then the customer shouldn't opt-in, all right? That's, we, want, we want, as Julie said, the customer to be in control of this, all right? If uh, you watch an NFL football game, do you like the NFL? How can I? I'm from. You know, I have family in Texas. But do you like? But do you I'm like an watching? Fan. You better be careful. Here. But do you like watching F-150 commercials? All right. Yeah. You see a lot of F-150 commercials on NFL football games. Why? Because it's just a real brute force approach to identifying an audience. A lot of men who drive pickups watch the NFL. But the ability to build an audience of people watching the NFL that we know that Julie is intending to buy a Honda or something. There's an audience out there that wants to buy Hondas so that Honda can now begin to, to advertise in the NFL or other products and services to people other than white males, uh, 25 to 40 years old, intending to buy a pickup truck. And you, know, you operate under laws with that, too. Absolutely. Truth in advertising, et cetera, some of these people don't. And there's a whole different notice. And you also, I think, have responsibility that, you know, if Chase doesn't add for a credit card, I don't want it put on a white supremacy site. That was happening all the time too. Yeah. Right. So there's a responsibility on the advertising. Is it true? Is it honest? Is it being properly disclosed? And you know, you're being honest, good with your own customers. Sure. Yeah. But generally, you guys think that customers are cool with that. They're they're, they're comfortable with that trade-off, right? But they're not with when the data gets removed one layer from that. Or when it's very very targeted to an individual, mm -hmm. or and not only cut when you say customers. 
the end user, the viewer, the, the, the audience, or the advertiser themselves. Advertisers, Jamie just made a comment, are uncomfortable with the, old, with the, the digital approach because their brands are showing up in places that they don't want their brands to show up. The part of the new advertising model is we can give you as an advertiser a lot of comfort where your brand is going to show up. So I guess just to round this out, since we have only a few minutes left, I want to think ahead to next year. Democratic Congress, Republicans in the Senate, Republican in the White House. Julie, do you think that this is going to, going to get done next year? Are we finally getting a privacy law? Because I have done this conversation for like a decade now, and we haven't really gotten <laughs> anything close oh, to the president's desk. Exactly, right. I am. This is the year. Okay. <laughs> but is we, we, we do believe this is year. And look, a divided Congress, if you look back, is oftentimes when you actually get things done. So we are optimistic. We think there's a lot of interest on both sides of the aisle. And, uh, you know, Tony, you keep coming back to what people want. It's very clear from the growth of the digital economy and digital services, people want to have these services, right? They want to be able to trust. And what we can do as businesses and what Congress can do is allow people to restore that trust. Because once you have that trust, right, there is so much that can be done for the individual, and we know they do want it, or they wouldn't be buying these services and participating. And so that's why we has come together as a business roundtable, and we're asking Congress, and we think there's interest on both sides of the aisle to help restore trust, um, which is going to protect the consumer and continue to make us the innovation economy of the world. Sure. Randall, what do you think? Look, this is, uh, you have these moments where there is legislation that it's just, it has to be done. And we are headed down a path of different states passing different legislation. It's inevitable. It's coming. It's being worked in multiple states. And uh, Congress has to act on this. And you, you're hard-pressed to talk to somebody in Congress who would not agree with that statement. They need to act. Now, I've often said that Congress can't even agree on the boiling temperature of water right now. But they, I think everybody agrees something has to be done here. So I think Julie has led a development of a framework that I think people can latch on to. There's going to be give and take, and there's going to be a lot of negotiation, but I do think there's something to be done here, and it can get done this year. Sure, Jamie, you get the last year. word. Yeah, I think something needs to be done, and I think also for security. This is, this is violating not just people's personal rights, but cyber rights, security, money, fraud. So I think something will be done. And like I said, we, we know which kind of what you, the principles you need, and then I hope it gets done right and it goes to whatever agencies and they get time to design it properly, very thoughtfully. And then, of course, it won't be perfect. So, you know, you should expect that there'll be certain things that will have to change over time as, you know, the view of people changes and the companies change and all that. But it, it really needs to get done. Sure. Well, we'll bet a beer over it and we'll see next year if this, uh, <laughs> if this actually happens. One beer the... oh, under in two years. Under two years? Under two. I'll take you on that. I'll take you on that. <laughs> um, well, anyways, that's all the time we've got. Thanks so much, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, just a reminder, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, uh, Julie Sweet from Accenture, and Randall Stevenson from at and I'm Tony Ron, the tech policy reporter at The Post. Uh, and thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mrs. Roundtable, thanks, for having Tony. us. Great question.